Okay, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about women in the 1920s. Um, first thing that you want to talk about is, is the women's suffrage movement. Lives, the, women, the lives of women were really changing in the 1920s, and probably nowhere is that better evidence than in the women's suffrage movement. And this is the drive for the right to vote. Suffrage is the right to vote. And women had been and trying to, to gain the right to vote for some time. And finally, in the 1920s, you get the passage of the, tw the 19th Amendment, which gives women the right to vote. Two of the women from the 1920s who were very active in this effort were Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, but certainly women had been doing this for a long time, and in years prior and decades prior, women such as Susan B. Anthony were very vocal and very powerful advocates for women gaining the right to vote. Another reason why the attitudes began to change in the 1920s in this regard is because of our experience during World War I, just prior to the 20s. Women had become much more active in everything. Uh, probably uh, nowhere better evidence than in the Army. For the first time, women were officially inducted into the Army, and in, the, in this case, the Army Corps of Nurses. Also, because so many men were taken out of the factories and uh, out of their traditional roles in the North, the factory owners had to result to non-traditional ways to fill their labor demands, and in many cases, that was hiring women. Uh, women were hired to work in the steel mills. Women were hired to work in the chemical plants. Women were hired to work in the munitions facilities, particularly with DuPont. And so women begin to view themselves differently as being capable of doing these things, and men begin to view them differently as well, as being capable of more than what people have maybe thought they were capable of prior to World War I. And so this really starts shifting the attitudes towards women in the United States. Along with these more active roles in society, women's styles begin to change as well. You start to see women's skirts grow shorter. This, does, this happens for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, during World War I, we just had a lack of material. Um, we had used a lot of material to clothe our armies and the armies of our allies, and so we needed to have fashions that just really used less material. Also, the more active lifestyles working in a factory weren't conducive to what traditionally had been women's clothing, i.e. long flowing skirts and dresses. Dresses and skirts that would go all the way down to the floor. They were floor length, or at least all the way down to the ankles. Uh, and so this wasn't practical if you were working in a steel mill around hot steel. You, you, you would catch the dress on fire if you were working in a, in, a, in a factory where there were lots of moving machinery. The dresses would get caught in that, and that was a safety hazard. And so they needed a skirt that was not only shorter but tighter uh, so that it, it, didn't, it didn't get caught up in things. And so this becomes the fashion of the day. You also get other fashions going by the wayside, uh, fashions such as the corsets. Uh, a corset was a, a type of garment that restricted the woman's waist so that she would have the ideal figure. Unfortunately, if you wore these for any length of time regularly, they could actually damage internal organs, and corsets were actually gone from fashion after the 1920s. Women's hairstyles also change. Uh, women go to a shorter hairstyle, much like the skirts. The long hair was considered impractical for working in a factory, for working in a, in a setting with machines with lots of moving parts. And so the hairstyle known as the bob, which was a short hairstyle, which would go ahead and just curl under down at the bottom, became popular during the 1920s, and it's still a style that you see uh, women uh, women wearing today. You also get women much more active in society. For instance, Margaret Sanger, who was a, a nurse uh, in New York City, she advocated for birth control in violation of the Comstock Law. You weren't allowed to talk, talk about birth control openly, and Margaret Sanger ends up being arrested for that. She's also the founder of Planned Parenthood, which today is an, associate, uh, uh, an organization affiliated a lot with abortion. Uh, and that fits right in with Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger I uh, was a, a believer in something called eugenics, where, you know, hey, if you go ahead and uh, uh, get rid of the undesirables in society, you'll make society better. Uh, or, in this case, for her part, it wasn't necessarily to get rid of the undesirables, but as a way to combat poverty, to break the cycle of poverty. If you don't want people to be in poverty, don't have them raised in poverty. So encourage the people who were living in poverty not to have kids, or not to have as many. Uh, and, and so this was part of the thinking. Of course, eugenics has a much darker side, too. Uh, that's with the whole the whole Nazis and the Holocaust and everything. Um, and so uh, that's also a bit controversial. Uh, in politics, you have women like uh, Miriam Ferguson and Nellie Ross, who became two of the first female governors, uh, Ferguson in Texas and Ross from Wyoming. You get the first female member to the House of Representatives and Jeanette Rankin from the state of Montana. And again, if you look at this, Texas, my, Wyoming, Montana, we don't, we don't think of this as like a progressive hotbed. We think of this, oh, those are all old, good old boys, hillbillies. But they were the first ones to elect women. And so kind of ahead of the curve on that. You also get more and more women in the workforce. Uh, by the end of the 1920s, one in five workers in the United States uh, were women. And you get women for the first time breaking into white-collar jobs, uh, jobs like doctors and lawyers. Uh, and, and so women begin to fill those jobs as well. 
Uh, women still had to deal with unequal pay. They were not paid as much for doing the same job in large part. That was because people perceived women as being a secondary income. They weren't the breadwinner. They weren't supporting a family. They were just going ahead and, and doing this kind of on the side. So we didn't need to pay them as much because they weren't supporting a family where a man was supporting a family. And this gets down to, so do you pay people based on what they need or do you pay people based on what their labor is worth, what their value is? Uh, which is an interesting discussion in and of itself. But uh, why don't we go ahead and take a moment, pause the video, and ask yourself a few questions, see if you can answer these after taking the notes.